Uh, so the topic of discussion today is brass. Um, there are main instruments that we rent here at our store. We have what's called high brass instruments and low brass instruments. In the high brass family are trumpets, which look like this, as well as French horns, uh, which is one of these over here. These are considered high brass. The trombones, the baritones, and tubas are low brass. Let's start with high brass. This is a trumpet. Um, obviously a brass instrument. All right, parts of the trumpet, um, we'll go the direction that the air goes through the instrument. It starts with the mouthpiece, which is where you blow in. The part the mouthpiece attaches to is a mouthpiece receiver. Then it goes into the lead pipe. And this curve down here is the tuning slide, which is how you'll tune your instrument. It slides in and out. And that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. The instruments are relatively in tune from the factory, but it changes because brass expands and contracts with temperature, which makes the instrument ever so slightly larger or smaller from a day to day basis, so you have to tune it every day when you play. If you're playing in a warm environment, then you're going to have to move it as opposed to a cold environment. Um, <clears throat> outside of that, then the air continues around, ends up in the valve section, has three valves. The number one valve is the one closest to you as a player, two's in the middle, three's in the far end, obviously, and there are tubes attached to each of these valves. The first valve slide is up here. Usually there's something that you can put your thumb in to adjust it, but not always. Um, that's just one of the features that I look for when I buy our rental trumpets. Our second valve slide doesn't move, but it does come out for the purpose of cleaning. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now the third valve slide you should be using on a regular basis. You notice it has a finger ring there so I can push it in and out. And the reason why that moves is because there are seven valve combinations on a trumpet and physically you can't make an instrument that's perfectly in tune which, with each valve combination. So the trumpet is made so that the two and three combination is in tune, but that means that the one and three combination is going to be slightly sharp. Um, because of the physics. So when you use the one and three valve combination, you really need to throw that slide out to make that note in tune. And it's a very, very subtle difference you're talking about. I mean, it's not, not even really audible to a novice, but to a professional or to people that want to play perfectly in tune with the rest of the band, they're going to need to do that. And they try to teach beginners to do that from day one. Um, but if a trumpet's not working properly and that's really hard to move with your finger, then these sixth graders that are beginning on the instrument sometimes neglect to do that. But that's what that, that finger ring is down here for. Um, you can adjust that to fit various sizes of hands. You can even take it out and put a marching lyre there that will hold your music um, if you're going to be playing it outside the marching band which keeps you from being able to slide that in and out if there's a lyre with music on there. Uh, but you can, you can relatively play it in tune if you use your lips to kind of bend the pitch down when you use the one and three combination. But there are seven valve combinations, and if you remember that number, that will come into play with the other instruments as well. As the air exits the valve section, then it goes around here. This is the, the bell crook, and it leads into the bell flare, and then you have the, the bell at the very end. And a trumpet is called a cylindrical instrument because the bore size of it, when I say bore, what I'm talking about is the diameter of the tubing. Um, the bore size remains constant all the way through the instrument until it gets to the bell flare. Um, and that's what makes a trumpet sound like a trumpet. If you've ever heard of an instrument called a cornet, it kind of looks like a trumpet, but typically they're a little bit shorter, a little bit taller. Cornet plays the same exact notes as a trumpet, but it uses a conical bore. And what a conical bore means is that it starts at one particular diameter, and as it travels through the instrument, it gradually tapers, sort of like a really long, thin funnel. And that makes it sound warmer and prettier than a trumpet. Same notes, different tone quality. Okay, to assemble a trumpet, there are basically two pieces in the case. You got the horn, and then you have the mouthpiece. Uh, it's not a complex assembly method like there is on a clarinet or a flute or a saxophone or anything like that. Um, to put the mouthpiece in the trumpet, really all you have to do is just sit it in the receiver, just kind of gradually push in a little bit as you give it just a little tiny twist, and that's, that's it. It won't come out, okay? Um, 
Although it sounds really cool, there's no need to pound it in. Then you risk getting your mouthpiece stuck in there. And if you have the instrument on your lap and it happens to fall on its mouthpiece, then that can get seriously stuck. If that happens, don't panic and don't try to pull it out with a pair of vice grips. Because what you end up doing is breaking the bracing on the horn and ripping the lead pipe off the instrument, which is very expensive and we see it happen all the time. If that gets stuck, then please bring the instrument into a repair shop. We pull mouthpieces for free at Springfield Music. There are special tools to do that. And it keeps dad or grandpa or mom from breaking your horn. To produce a sound in a trumpet, you use your lips and the vibration of your lips to make a noise. So it's like a A lot of directors will have their students start by buzzing just through the mouthpiece. So if you produce a buzz, Without the mouthpiece, you're naturally holding your cheeks in. That's a correct formation of your lips. Then when you center the mouthpiece on your lips and imitate that same buzz, and it sounds sort of like a crying duck or something like that. Uh, put it in the trumpet and then do the same thing. Now without using the vowels on the trumpet, there are different notes called partials. And if you're a guitar player at all, you might think of a partial as a guitar string. You have six strings on a six string guitar, obviously. But within each string, you have tons of different notes that you can play by using frets. But if you think of partials, there are numerous notes you can play on a trumpet without even pushing out a bat. And how you switch from one to the other is by the pressure of the buzz on your lips as well as your airspeed. So you can play starting low and going high, they sound sort of like this. how when you see in, uh, in TV or on movies and bugles that they use for militaries, that's how they can do those calls without having any vows. So and you can do all that without moving a single vowel. Now the valve is utilized to play all the notes in between the partials. So if I play these two notes, I can't play any of the notes in between without using the vowels. So that's essentially how to play a trumpet. Like I said, there are seven different valve combinations and uh, you learn them one at a time, so it's not that complicated. But the hardest part about playing a trumpet, besides remembering the notes, is developing enough strength in your embouchure and in your face to be able to play higher notes because they obviously require more pressure and more strength. So, on trumpets, there are basically four different types of lyres that we sell. Uh, this trumpet would be a good candidate for a what we call a bent trumpet lyre. And how it works is you would take off your finger ring down here. And a bent trumpet lyre looks like this. It has a 90 degree bent end in the end. You can put it between your bell and your lead pipe. It will go right in the spot where I removed that pinky ring. You can clamp it down and voila, you have a place to hold your music so you can read it when you're outside playing. Other versions of this lyre, because this one is bent, is a straight trumpet lyre, which would not work on this trumpet because it doesn't have any other type of lyre attachment. Some manufacturers will put a separate attachment down there specifically for a straight trumpet lyre. King is one of those brands, for example. That would be good for that. This trumpet could also use a clamp-on lyre. Looks like this. This will clamp onto the lead pipe up here. And I can tighten down this bracket to make it stay. If you do that, make sure you put it over the finger ring here. That keeps the lyre from slipping side to side. Even though it has rubber feet on it, that's more for protection. It still doesn't offer enough grip to keep it from falling over while you play. And then the last option for a trumpet lyre is this. And this is a built-in flip folder for your music that comes with these brackets on it. I can actually uh, loosen those on the other side and clamp that to the bell of my horn. 
so it doesn't interfere with any part of the plane. So those are the four different types of trumpet lighters. When you're done playing the trumpet every day, you don't need to swab it out like you do on a flute or a clarinet. You might open up this, which is called a water key. Some people call it a spit valve, but it's more water than it is spit. Um, the reason why it's water is because you have cold metal with warm moist air you're blowing through it and when you have warm moist air encountering a cold object you have an amount of condensation that occurs. So you have condensation happening inside here and that moisture out of the air accumulates. Plus there is a, you know, there's a significant amount of spitting that goes on there too. So that's why it's called a spit valve. And if I were playing this for 10 or 15 minutes I would need to empty that because the horn literally fill up and start sounding like blur. Uh, just empty your spit valve. You may choose to polish the instrument when you put it away every day. It's not a requirement, but if you do polish your trumpet on a somewhat regular basis or any brass instrument, you need to make sure you're using the right polish cloth. Um, because when your trumpet looks gold, it's actually not gold, it's just brass that's been polished and then coated with a clear coating called lacquer. And um, lacquer and silver are two totally different things. If you have a silver trumpet, you would want to use a silver polishing cloth because what happens when you polish silver is it removes microscopic pieces of metal every time you polish silver. If I were to use that cloth on this lacquered instrument, I'd be removing microscopic pieces of lacquer every time I polish it and eventually wear through the finish and get the raw brass. Probably you don't want that to happen if you want it to stay shiny. So if you're using a lacquered instrument, you want to use a polishing cloth designed for lack. When you go to clean your instrument um, once every couple of months, maybe uh, every three or four months or something like that, you can actually disassemble the horn and submerse it in water and give it a bath. We recommend you cleaning your instrument every month or every two months or every three months by taking it apart and giving it a bath in a bathtub. Uh, you'll need to take off all the moving parts. The caps come off, the valves come out, the slides come out. Now when you take out your valve to clean your instrument though, I would leave this part assembled. There's a spring in there, there are valve guides in there, and unless you know what you're doing, if you take that all the way apart, it's kind of hard to get back together. So you can put this in water and clean it just fine as it stands right here then take it out, flush it off with, with clean water. You don't have to take every single little spring out of there, okay? Leave that for the professionals. Um, to clean the inside of your trumpet, they make these flexible brushes called cleaning snakes that have brushes on the end of them. They're flexible, and you can dip this in a little solution, a little bit of dish soap, a little bit of water, and make it soapy, and you can run it through the inside of the instrument in your bathtub and then just flush it out with lots of clean water and you'll be good to go. One thing that you definitely should not do when you clean your brass instrument is use hot water. Use lukewarm or even cool water. Uh, lukewarm is really the best. The reason why you don't want to use hot, hot water when you clean your brass instrument is because it will cause your metal to expand very quickly, quicker than the lacquer can keep up with. I learned this the hard way though. <laughs> Uh, and when that happens, when your instrument cools down and you dry it, you'll notice that all of your clear plated lacquer just falls right off. So, lukewarm water when you clean your brass instruments. If you ever need to find the serial number to a trumpet, it is almost always stamped on the left hand side of the instrument as you're playing it, stamped on the second valve casing. If it's not there, then look on the mouthpiece receiver and it'll probably be seen there. Saying within the high brass family, this is a French horn. This is known as a single horn because a French horn being in the key of F has three valves. If it had four valves, one operated by my thumb, then that would give you the opportunity to put it in the key of B flat as well. And you would have tuning slides off of each valve. You would have your F tuning slides and you'd have your B flat tuning slides, you essentially have two horns in one, which is why, why it would be called a double horn. This one is a single horn because it only has three valves. That's an easy way to identify it. Uh, just like the trumpet, it, it has a thing called a bore size. 
although on a French horn it's more of a uh, it's a much longer instrument but it's more of a conical bore sort of like a um, sort of like a cornet so it kind of gives you a really warm dark pretty sound the mouthpiece mouthpiece receiver lead pipe curves around this is the tuning slide for the instrument just like you saw the one on the trumpet and then it goes into the valve assembly. Now this one uses rotary valves instead of piston valves. There's little valves in there that spin as opposed to going up and down on the trumpet. And rotary valves cannot be removed by the player of the instrument. You really need to have specialized training to take those out, which means it's really important to keep your French horn clean because when those valves get dirty, they start sticking. And really the only way to clean a valve is to take it to a repair guy, have them take it out using their special process so they don't damage anything. Always play with a clean mouth anyway, but even more important on a French one. You can't really give it a bath like you can a trumpet. You can give the tuning slides a bath if you want to, which is where most of the stuff settles and accumulates anyway, because it goes downward. Um, but the valve section, take it to the pro. Yeah. This is the only instrument where you have to stick your hand in the bell when you play it. And you can talk to your band director about how to hold your hand and in which position. Just like the trumpet, there are different partials on a French horn. You'll notice that there's a lot more partials a lot closer together than what I played on a trumpet which makes the French horn a relatively complex instrument to play. If you're a French horn player, you're probably a pretty smart cookie. You have to really know what you're doing. You have to have a good ear. You have to be able to hear if you're on the wrong note or not, because it's a lot harder to feel the notes than it is on the trumpet, because they're all so close together. But a lot of similarities to the trumpet. It's just a much differently shaped instrument. It's in the key of F, whereas the trumpet is in the key of B flat. They're both transposing instruments, which means they, the notes they play are called different names than what we hear, like if you were to match it up on the piano. Marching lyres for French horns do exist, but they're not used very often because most of the time in school band settings, they will be using a marching French horn. Marching French horn sort of looks like a huge trumpet with a bell that big around. Um, a little bit longer, obviously, but it plays and sounds like a French horn. Um, you'll get lyres specifically for those. Sometimes concert French horns like this will have lyre attachments somewhere on them. I don't think this one does. Sometimes they will, and that's so random there's no right or wrong answer to that. I have to bring their instrument in so that we can fit something up to appropriately. If you need to find the serial number on your horn, it is usually stamped somewhere around the valves. In the low brass family, we have trombones, baritones, or euphoniums, and tubas. Uh, this is a trombone. Of all the brass instruments, this is the most complicated to put together because it comes in two big pieces. Well, how to assemble your trombone is to put your slide into your bell receiver there and then twist it around so it's in playing position while just gradually applying some pressure. So see it's holding itself right there without even tightening the clamp because I kind of squeezed them together as I moved it. Okay, And you disassemble it the same way. But almost in a line like that, kind of push it together as you turn it. It'll stay there but there's also a a clamp to hold it there as well so it doesn't accidentally turn as you're playing the instrument. Mouthpiece doesn't require much pressure at all. Just sit it in there, give it a little bit of a twist, and it's it's not going anywhere. Um, the parts of trombone, you have your mouthpiece, goes into your hand slide, which this is a moving part of it. Now just like on high brass instruments there are seven valve combinations, how many slide positions Seven, good answer. Okay, that's exactly right. All right, anyway, it goes through the slide. This is the slide crook down here. Uh, this is a water key, otherwise known as a spit valve. 
is mostly water, remember. But there's a little bit of spit, so don't put it in your girlfriend's hair. Uh, it goes up through the instrument. This is the tuning slide up on top to tune the instrument. And then you have the bell flare. To play a trombone, you buzz your lips just like you do any other brass instrument. The mouthpiece is quite a bit bigger, though. Uh, so I think it's easier to play. This is, this is my favorite instrument. There are partials on a trombone, which are the different notes you can play without even moving the slide. Um, just like on the other instruments, high brass and low brass, I'll, I'll play some of those. And the slide is for filling on in all the notes in between. When you're done playing it every day, of course, empty your water key so there's no moisture left in it. Um, you can wipe it down. On a trombone, you have your slide assembly, and the most common type of trombone wire looks like this. Some of, sometimes you can find these that are adjustable where you can move the clamp part further away on this post. But how it goes on a trombone is right over the mouthpiece receiver here. So anyway, now you have a place you can hold your music there and it doesn't interfere with the slide and it doesn't put the music right there in front of your face. Uh, another version of a trombone wire is this, which has clamps on it. You can clamp it to your trombone bell and that'll hold the music so you can read it while you play. To clean the instrument, which we recommend cleaning your instrument every month or two, depending on how often you play, you can fully disassemble your trombone. You can take your slide all the way apart. You can take your bell off, take your mouthpiece off. You can take your tuning slide out. And you can actually give this a bath in lukewarm water in a bathtub. Uh, continuing on with the low brass family, this is a baritone. Uh, another word or another instrument that is very similar to a baritone is an instrument called a euphonium. The differences are is that a baritone uses a cylindrical bore like a trumpet where the size of your tuning stays the same all the way through the instrument until it gets to the bell and it starts getting larger. On a euphonium, it's sort of like a cornet. It uses a conical bore. Baritones and euphoniums play the same notes as trombones do. So, they also use the same mouthpiece. I can take my trombone mouthpiece, put it in my baritone, and I'm good to go. The baritone, because of the way it's made, is a little bit mellower. Again, you have seven valve combinations, just like you do on a trumpet. doesn't necessarily make it euphonium. When you play a one and three valve combination on a brass instrument, it's slightly sharp. The fourth valve is a substitute for one and three. You play it instead of one and three, and you can make it so that fourth valve is in two. But what it also does is it opens up the range of the instrument, because when you play so low on this, you run out of notes before you have to drop down to a pedal note. <laughs> And that's a pretty big gap. Usually schools will use a marching baritone as opposed to a concert shaped baritone like this one. A marching baritone looks like a big trumpet, only with the bell that big around. And it sounds like a baritone. So there are specific lyres to use on marching baritones. This one happens to have a lyre mount right here. 
which would need to bring the music out to this playing position. Different manufacturers of baritones will put their lyre mounts elsewhere on the instrument. There's no consistency to that. Every brand's slightly different. So if you have a baritone and you need a lyre, bring it into the store and we'll find something to match it up for you. To oil the valve on your baritone, you will obviously need to take it out of the instrument. And when you do, try to be careful because these are very fragile and delicate things. If you get a dent or a scratch in this, you're going to have sticky valves until you take it in and get a service. And a repair charge on a valve is automatically starting at 50 bucks. And that gets quite a bit more expensive than that depending on how much damage is on it. So be really careful with these. Take it out and take your valve oil. And it's kind of a messy process because you really can't use too much oil. You'll just dab oil all over your valve. And you'll notice when I go to put this back in the instrument, I let it dangle. That way there's no resistance, there's no torquing or tension. I just kind of let it hang and then I drop it into the instrument like that. Give it a couple of spins to disperse the oil. Line up your valve guide that's in there. Your valve guide needs to be in line, otherwise you won't be able to blow any air through your horn. And voila! Much better working valve. You'll probably oil your valves every day. You really only need to grease probably every time you give it a bath. Or maybe once a month if you feel them drying out, if they start becoming hard to move or jerky or something like that, then you may want to put some more grease on it. To grease the tuning slide, um, you will use a different product than what you did when you oiled your valves. Uh, valve oil is a very thin, almost water-like substance. Uh, it's very slick. It makes your valves run very fast. To grease your tuning slide, you can pull out your slide and use a tuning slide grease on there. And it's more of a gooey syrupy almost kind of substance and the reason why is because when you put your tuning slide in at a certain distance you want it to stay there you don't want it to actually accidentally fall out as you're playing the instrument so therefore it's much slicker and that's why we call these grease and the valves use oil how you bathe this instrument is to fully disassemble it you can take out of course the mouthpiece but all these uh, tuning slides will come out, the valves will come out. Once you have it apart, you can put it in a bathtub full of lukewarm water, not hot water. When you take the valve out, it looks sort of like this. I would leave this part together. You can technically unscrew the cap off of this, and the post, and the valve guide, and everything can come apart. But if you don't know what you're doing, that can get kind of complicated to put back together correctly. So you can clean it like this just fine. Not worry about damaging anything. Um, make sure you rinse the instrument out with clean water before you put it back together because soap will seriously gum up your valves. Um, I put together a solution of half dish soap and half water. I kind of stir it up and then when I use a cleaning snake, I just dip it in that soap solution and then run it into the horn clean it out on the inside. You should clean your brass instruments thoroughly uh, with a bathtub and soapy water, I would say at least every couple of months.